It's been a couple weeks since we looked at this, and I know you probably, you may not remember where we left off last time, but I I had said that there were seven principles, and I I don't think I gave you those seven principles, Um, but in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, we had began... And we were going to look at verse 1 through 31. And, and if you remember, this, I had kind of said that there's no way we could get to that all in one night. But there's really only two thoughts. There's, you know, verses 1 through 5 is one thought. And then verse 6 through 31 is the other thought. But we had left off in verse 11. I'll, I'll read down to verse 17. I don't know if we'll get to all 31 verses because in verse 32, it starts a new thought that really could be in chapter 5. So uh, the thought that started in chapter 4, verse 1, kind of stops in verse 31. So let's start in verse 11. And this is the stone which said it not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them, that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it is spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for saving our souls. Thank you, Father, for the eternal life which you give us, the victory we have in, in Christ. Father, we pray for those who are we mentioned here tonight, Father, those who we may not have mentioned, who's on our hearts, Father, who you know each one of our hearts, you know, Father, our desires, Father, you know, Lord, the, the ones that uh, we dwell upon in our minds, Father, hoping that you'd save them. Father, we, we do pray, Father, and trust in you and your will, and Father, we pray for Pastor and, and Sister Kathy that you'll strengthen our pastor and that you'll heal him and 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 uh, bring him back father in full strength and we'll give you all the praise and the glory father we do pray for the word tonight that you'll just show us and instruct us in your word that it may penetrate our hearts and change our lives and we'll thank you father and give you the glory in jesus name amen so as a recap chapter four through 31, the title of the message is The Model of the Suffering Saints. The Model of the Suffering Saints. You know, what's interesting, for the first time, we actually see the church here being persecuted. Now, we know that Jesus started the church during his earthly ministry, so when I say the first time for this, first time for that, What I mean is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the absence of Jesus Christ himself. So this is the first time that they have gone out and they're starting to preach the gospel. But this is the first time that we actually see a consequence for it in chapter 4. So just to recap, from starting at the very beginning of Acts, we saw that Jesus charged his disciples and his church to preach in in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost. And we actually see the book of Acts chopped into those different categories, how they preach Jerusalem and then Judea and then Samaria and then the uttermost. And we see that Jesus ascended. Then we see the day of Pentecost. And then we saw the lame man at the beautiful gate. We see the, the sermon which Peter had preached in Jesus' name. And then now we've come to the part of the Sanhedrin. Just to to give you just a small recap that in chapter 4, verse 1, we see how this persecution starts, that as they spake unto the people, 
the priests and captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. And that was uh, Peter and John. And they were grieved, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now even tide. We see a very uh, important milestone here. So they lay hold on the preachers of the gospel, and they put them in jail until the next day, because the Sanhedrin did not convene at night. They convened during the day, so they had to stay overnight. Uh, but we see that, howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. So we see this persecution that starts right here upon the church, and it's been going ever since. Uh, you know, the Lord's churches have been persecuted, and it's been a trail of blood. Uh, ever since we, we see Jesus being persecuted and now we're seeing his church it does not take very long but when Jesus was with them he warned them uh, that this would actually happen in John 16 1 he says these things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended that they shall put you out of the synagogues yea the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service and these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. So we see Jesus telling his disciples to expect this kind of behavior. Uh, another thing that we see, and that's very interesting to me if, if you're if you love the books of first Peter and second Peter you see the encouragement that Peter's giving the persecuted saints in first and second Peter and then we're actually seeing Peter preach the gospel and suffering uh, persecution in real time in Acts so it, it's it's interesting how we can have two perspectives we can have the perspective of, of Peter actually doing it and then we can have we'll, we will be flipping over the first Peter uh, and watch and reading about how Peter teaches us how to suffer as Christ suffered. We see that the Sadducees were here and they're the ones that laid hold on Peter and John. And if you remember, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees typically they took care of the temple. They, they were the, the ones that were the officials in the temple. And now the Sanhedrin didn't comprise only of Sadducees. They, the Sanhedrin were a council. They were a collective. They had Pharisees. You had, Sanhed you had uh, Sadducees. You had different, uh, the, the different sects of the Jews. Um, then we see, you know, they were grieved that they taught the people. They laid hands on them. And now... We've come to verse 5, and I want to give you, in case you didn't get the first principle, and this is how to react to persecution. As God's people, we see a model of how to suffer, and we see the first of all, and we see seven principles, is first of all, be submissive. When they laid hands on Peter and John, they didn't kick and scream or anything like that. Uh, they were submissive to the authority. And that is what we're taught. We're, we're taught, you know, if we are arrested, we go in submission. Uh, if you're preaching in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you don't want to have an attitude or a reaction that would not bring glory to God because then it's in vain. It's, you're no different than the world. So the first thing we see is they were submissive. They didn't really kick up a lot. Uh, the second thing in verse 8, A, and now when I say A and B, and it just means A means the beginning of the verse, and B means this, the, the second part of the verse. But here at the beginning, then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders, of Israel, So we see that now Peter is in front of the Sanhedrin. He's in, the, Peter and John are in front of the, the Sanhedrin in the council. And you see that in verse 6. 
and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. This comprised of the Sanhedrin. You had the rulers, the elders, and the scribes. It was a pretty big crowd. It was a, it was a pretty big council. And these were the, the ones that were supposed to be in, in charge of you know, the religious order. And so Peter and John in front of them, and Peter begins to preach. And Peter begins to preach. But look at the, uh, I'm sorry, in, in verse 7, I'm trying to do a recap and go forward at the same time. Maybe I should just start it all over. I don't know. I don't know how many of you all remembered two weeks ago when we went over this. But verse 7, it says, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by name have you done this? So, you know, they're talking about the, the healing of the lame man at the beautiful gate. And so now we see then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. So he starts to preach. And we should always preach or teach or declare the gospel in the Spirit. We should always depend and trust and lean upon the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the second point, if you are ever faced with persecution, is be in the Spirit. And if you are to be in persecution and you are going to preach the gospel to do all things being filled with the Spirit. And I believe last time we had also looked at this verb here that Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost was a passive type of verb. It means the action happened to Peter. So Peter didn't force it. Peter didn't pray it down like the Pentecostal churches. Peter didn't do a bunch of you know, uh, tricks and things like that. But you, you know what's amazing is it doesn't take much to see the difference between someone who has it fake <laughs> versus someone who has the real Holy Spirit. You know, then that's teaching, you know, and then they're preaching through Jesus' name or teaching or living a life in the Spirit, even. Um, so he wasn't faking this, and the, 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 the passive verb, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The believer has the presence of the Holy Spirit and his power in their lives when they walk in obedience to God's word. So we yield to the power of the Holy Spirit. It's all through uh, the scriptures uh, that we see. So point number three comes from 8b through verse 13. 8b through verse 13. And that is that we are to be bold in the opportunities that God has given us to preach. Even if it's in the face of persecution. Now think about Peter and John. And uh, here and Peter is lifting up his voice and he's bold. And he says in verse 9, If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom ye crucified <laughs> whom God raised from the dead even by him doth this man stand here before you whole so the boldness Peter was emboldened to I mean he accused the Jews right to their face and you know that's interesting because the, the same thing with the uh, Jesus and Pilate and Pilate was like don't you know that I have the power to let you go or I can do you know and the thing is is no person has the power over us unless it's given by the father we should not be afraid to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so he was definitely not he met them at their condition of sin and as we teach or preach the gospel of Jesus Christ it's very important that we confront people with their sin. It shouldn't be a mixture of words or a feel-good sermon. I mean, I got to thinking about that. You know, there's some messages and teachings that, that we could get into where it may not directly relate to the gospel, but we should still teach and preach the gospel. Because it may be the last time you hear the gospel. It may be the last time I teach or preach the gospel. And I got to thinking about the, the sermonettes that people are getting in these 
highfalutin churches or mega churches or whatever they're called and I mean they're just they're not hearing that they're sinners and they need to repent before an all holy and righteous God you know they're hearing that if I'm okay you're okay and let's you know uh, seems that like they're making the merchandise of their souls and we can see that you know you can see the the high dollar things and not to say that God couldn't bless one of his churches one of his kind of churches uh, to be in a big building but you don't usually see that nowadays you usually see his kind of assembly just in smaller types of churches because as, as I was being raised um, one of the things that dad was always saying was instead of building a big church build a lot of little churches because as you get a big church you're going to get preachers you're going to get students of the word you're going to get missionaries you're, you know you're going to get all these things we'll start spreading the work you know so it's not so much that we're, we're building up this church as we're, we're building out you know and so that's you know the main objective is to send missionaries but here Peter refused to compromise the gospel by what would offend and it certainly would have the Sanhedrin Peter was telling them that God's Christ was Jesus that the very God of their fathers the God of Abraham the God of Isaac the God of Jacob the God of the prophets that this Messiah was God's Messiah and you put him to death now you are an enemy to God you are an enemy to the very thing that you're standing here being religious about that they're getting their living from their prestige I mean could you imagine how much that would have offended them? That's where, their, that's where their living was coming from. They crucified God's Christ. There should be no place or time where the preaching of the gospel should be compromised, being afraid of what would happen to us. So this is where I think we left off last time, was the stone. In verse 11, this is a stone which was set at nod of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. There's a lot of beautiful uh, metaphors and symbolism here, and we see it introduced in the Old Testament uh, as this type of symbolism. In Psalm 118, it says, I will, uh, Psalm 118, 21, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the head stone of the corner. If you would, turn to 1 Peter, if you want to keep your fingers here. 1 Peter, like I said, we would be kind of going back and forth between here and 1 Peter. This isn't the only time 1 Peter brings up that Christ is the cornerstone. In chapter 4, Verse 12. I'm sorry, that's, that's not the right. It's actually chapter 2, verse 6. Chapter 2. Verse 6. He says, well, let's, I'm sorry, let's start at verse 4. Let's just get the whole context. To whom coming as unto a living stone... Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. We see Jesus refer to himself as the head of the corner when he gives the parable of the husbandman. And um, if you have time to read that, it's, it's, a, beautiful, it's a beautiful parable. It's in, uh, let's see, it's in Mark chapter 12, 
verse 10. But here, when he talks about in verse 11, in Acts chapter 4, verse 11, this is the stone which was set at naught of, notice he said, you builders. You builders. So the builders, the Sanhedrin regarded themselves as the builders as being because they were at the head of the ecclesiastical government they were head of this uh, governmental religion of the people they settled the order of ceremonies duties obligations and required men virtually to take the religion from them they would advise and direct and the people should have no will of their own in religious matters so it's interesting the sanhedrin themselves considered themselves to be the builders and I had mentioned this last time, and I, I think it's, it's beautiful. The whole picture in Psalm 118 and Matthew 21, verse 42, it's also found there. The stone was meant for the foundation, but the builders did not place it there, and afterwards could find no place to fit it. So they rejected it and cast it aside. Then as they moved about their work, it lay in their way, and they stumbled over it and fell, stone of stumbling. Lastly, God himself takes up the stone and places it in the most conspicuous place of all as the headstone of the corner. And the rejected one becomes the judge and punisher of those who rejected him. And it says, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. This is Matthew chapter 21, verse 44. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. The Jews may have rejected Jesus Christ of Nazareth as the, Messiah, as the Messiah, but God has lifted Jesus Christ up in a place of preeminence. He was the head of the corner. And so there was a, a beautiful picture there. Now in verse 12 it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Peter goes from declaring that this miracle was done in the name of Jesus, and oh yeah, by the way, there's salvation in no other name but Jesus. Now remember who he's talking to. He's talking to the Jews. Uh, your way of salvation, you thought you were going to heaven, that's not the way. Oh, I mean, that's a slap in the face of all of their customs and their traditions and their inheritance and and, you know, who are these, the, these two men? But what they couldn't do was deny that they had done a miracle. And the Jews knew that any person that did a miracle was of God. And so they, they, they were stuck. They were stuck. They, they could not refute what they were saying because they had the power to back it up and what they were doing. What continues to be amazing, and now think about this, Verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given or under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's amazing how simple faith is. Consider how com complicated the Jewish religion was, all the laws, all the ceremonial laws. Uh, you know, everything had a condition. Now, consider how complicated other religions are. But consider how simple faith is. It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Now, it takes a miracle of God for a person to be convicted and sit, you know, and, and beg for mercy because they see themselves as a sinner because our pride is very powerful. And, but... You know, we know how marvelous, once we're saved, we see the wisdom of God in salvation. Once we start learning about justification and election and God's sovereignty and glorification and redemption and adoption and sanctification, it's all beautiful, all beautiful on this back end, but as you're coming to faith, it's very simple. Isn't that the wisdom of God? That he has put all of this wonderful work in the salvation of Christ. But yet, 
Repentance and faith is so easy. It's not easy, but it's simple. It's simple. It's very uncomplicated. Not only is it simple, but it is exclusively Jesus. It's only through Jesus. Ultimately, there are two religious paths. There's the broad way, which leadeth to destruction. And then there is the narrow way, which is faith in Jesus Christ, which leadeth to life, eternal life. Christ, Christians, now, you know, what's interesting, I don't know, I only know about my day and age, but it seems like ever more that, think about the Christians preach an exclusive Christ in an inclusive age. It seems like, I mean, uh, well, who was it, Oprah, who came out and said there's literally a million different ways to go to heaven. And so everybody thinks everything is a way to heaven, as long as you're not bad. And you know what's interesting is, it, and I was thinking about this last week as I was talking about the law in Romans chapter 2. I probably should have defined how easy it is to, I mean, the, the law is not some distant term that just belongs to the Jews. It belongs to all of us. It, it's that matter of if I think I'm good enough to go to heaven, what are you basing that good and evil off of? You're basing it off the law. You're basing it off the law of God. And so if there's no flesh shall be justified by the deeds of the law, then there shall no flesh be going to heaven based on their good or their bad. Or it is based on Jesus Christ. It's the simple gospel, and it's the exclusive gospel of preaching. Uh, if the Sanhedrin would not repent and believe that Jesus was the Christ, and through his name alone was salvation, then those people that were in that hall are in hell this very day. the same gospel it's the same preaching it's the exclusive preaching of Jesus Christ being the only way of salvation Jesus exclusive Jesus was exclusive he says I am the way the truth the life no man cometh unto the father except by me so if you think about that that's it's quite interesting because we know they rejected him or at least there in this, in this account that Sanhedrin rejected. Now we know that 5,000 were saved, but in front of the Sanhedrin, we later see that they send them to jail. Those very people are in hell today. And so it is in our generation. We preach the same Christ. We preach the same gospel. We, we are preaching to the same people who are rejecting it. And it's the same outcome. And so it is it's startling when you start to think about, you know, these aren't just stories. These are accounts. These are historical accounts. But notice the double use of salvation and saved. There is neither salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Just by using the word saved and salvation implies peril. You know, so he was preaching to them the peril that they were to be in if they did not receive Christ as their Savior. So the, the rest of the verses, we're going to go pretty quick. In verse 13, we're, we're still on that third point. To be bold. To preach in the name of Christ. To not worry about the consequence of preaching to be, you know, the gospel should be simple and it should be exclusive. And that's the boldness. You know, we confront people with their sin, where they're at, not worried if we're going to offend them. Because I'm doing you a worse service if I don't preach you Christ, if I don't preach you that you're a sinner before Christ and all holy God. You know, uh, people want to spare people's feelings. And it's not about sparing people's feelings. It's about you know, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and sparing their soul and let God work it in their hearts and me being accountable <laughs> for what I preach. So verse 13, 
the Sanhedrin got triggered. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the men which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it, which is we already talked about. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. Um, sorry. That they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Um, let me stop there and give you number four, because point number four goes through verse 14 to verse 22. And it is be obedient to God despite the cost. Be obedient to God despite the cost. In verse 16, again, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. The words of Jesus to his apostles had been fulfilled. In Luke 21, 12, it says, But before all these they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and to prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my namesake. It's a beautiful comparison of Scripture, which the, Jesus had warned them exactly what would happen is actually happening right here. And verse 13 of, if you want to, I probably uh, should have had you turn there, but, and it shall turn you for a testimony Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. That their adversaries would not be able to gainsay nor resist. Uh, we see verse 16 through 18, the hard hearts of the Sanhedrin. And verse 16 saying... I'm not going to read again. Verse 17, But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. And you talk about the hard hearts that we see here and the rejection of Christ. It just went straight over their head. I mean, it didn't penetrate at all. It did not penetrate. They said we, they couldn't deny the miracle. And, I mean, I, I don't know. I would be very confused if you rejected the name of Jesus Christ here, but you couldn't deny the miracle. And so that's exactly what happened. You know, though they saw this miracle done and 5,000 people believed, the religious leaders were blind and could not see. Even when they were told what happened at the resurrection of Jesus. Now, uh, let's turn here real quick. Matthew chapter 28. Just showing you the blindness. Now, to us, we see the evidence. We, 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 we're like, why have you not received Jesus Christ as your Savior? I mean, look at the miracles, which he did. You know, and that's the thing. And that's, uh, you know... Uh, how true it is that you know Lazarus and Abraham's bosom you know he you know or no I'm sorry the uh, the 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 rich man in torment and in Abraham and in his bosom he said just send somebody to to go to my brothers and maybe you know Abraham's like if, even if I raise somebody even if there were a miracle done they still would not believe because we see evidence of this here in Matthew chapter 28 verse 11 now, when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done, the resurrection. <laughs> and the angel <laughs> sitting on the tomb, you know? And um, but verse 12, And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while he slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. 
I mean, how hard of a heart that you, I mean, the, you know, the, the guards had seen the miracles, that had seen the angels. I mean, they remember they, they quaked. The, the, their knees were, were, were shaking at the, the angel. And they came and reported it unto the, the religious leaders. And they said, here, take this money and tell a lie about what happened. Jesus rose from the dead. They, they didn't focus on that. They focused on, let's make sure that nobody else believes in him. And that's exactly what we see here in Acts chapter 4. How this man was lame from his, his, you know, from, from his birth. Or from a, from a small age. In verse 17, they said, but it spread no further. And we see the exact same thing among the people. And back in Acts chapter 4. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. They saw these miracles, and yet they rejected. In verse 23, I'm sorry, not verse 23, uh, going on in verse 18, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God judge ye for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard so when they had further threatened them they let them go finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people for all men glorified God for that which was done for the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed so we see the the point of be obedient to God despite what it may cost to us. So that was, you know, you're, you're charging us not to preach in Jesus' name. Shall we obey you or shall we obey God? So that is one of the few times that we are not to be submissive to authority or government is when it conflicts with what God has given us to do or one of his commands um, is and during those times. The fifth principle if when we're being persecuted is be faithful in fellowship in verse 23 it says and being let go they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them and when they had heard that i'm sorry just verse 23 was the one point the first thing peter and john did when they were released from prison was they went to their own company their companions there is a unity that comes to God's people by encouraging one another in our battles, especially when we strive against sin and we strive against the world or we, you know, it's, it, it feels good to come in here and know that we all ha are like-minded, you know, that, that we all um, love the Lord and we all love, the, you know, what the, lo the, what, what the Lord loves. And it's just, you know, you... I don't know if y'all watched any kind of coverage after the debate last night, but it didn't matter which channel you moved through, that Biden did wonderful and Trump did awful. And, I mean, I think they both kind of misbehaved. Uh, I think Trump could have just stayed on the facts of what he has been able to accomplish, and he would have been fine. But, uh, unfortunately, he didn't do that. Um, but it didn't really matter. The commentators were still lifting up Joe Biden. And it's just the world's full of that everywhere you go. But it's good when you're amongst God's people to, to know that we know the sanctity of life. We know that, you know, thus saith the Lord. We know murder's wrong. We know what marriage is. We, you know, we love the Lord. And the Lord is the one that puts that spirit in our hearts to seek him and to love him and to understand his truth and to love his truth and be convicted over sin. You know, um, something that's hard to explain to the world is that the world is the way it is because of sin. It really is. And, you know, the I'm just thinking of, you know, the bad police officers who are doing bad things to black people. I'm thinking about that, but there's good police officers. And if I were a good police officer, I'd be mad. Wouldn't you? Well, just like 
we're God's people and we preach in love. We, we are not preaching in hate. We do not have hate speech. But there's some so-called Christians who are doing hate speech, who are condemning others, who are going out, blowing up abortion clinics, and it makes us upset because now the whole world perceives that's who we are. And we're not. But they presume we are. And so if, if I were a good police officer, I'd be upset by the bad behavior of, of the other police officers. If, you know, I mean, there is bad in every group. I think I said that Sunday, so I won't re-preach that. But uh, you know what I mean, and it's, it's just, it's sin. It's hard to explain to people. It's sin. Uh, Joe Biden said, I think he said, uh, vote for me. I'm paraphrasing, but I think you'll know what I mean. He said, I'll, let's fix racism. You're never going to fix racism. Amen. Ever. You're never going you're, you're to fix poverty. You're never going to fix the, the, the social class systems, the, high, the higher class, the looking down on people. You're never going to fix murder. You're never going to fix lying. You're never going to fix cheating or adultery or any of those things. Only the Lord can do that. And when he comes and he sets up the, the new heavens and the new earth, then we will be without sin. Amen. And that's when and only then. I mean, we, that doesn't give an excuse to ignore it or to condone it or to, you know, whatever, say it is what it is. I mean, we should stand up upon the truth of the word of God. You know, racism should bother us. We're all of one blood. You know, and... Uh, I loved what Manasseh said. When we get into heaven, how many different nations, all the different languages, and all the different kindreds, and all the different tongues will be in heaven. The Lord will save from every part of the earth. You know, just a diverse group will be up there. You know, I mean, we'll all have glorified bodies, but let me get to these last two points. Or April will get on me. Verse 20. Four through 28 is be content in God's providence in verse 24 and when they had when they heard that they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said Lord thou art God which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them or all I'm sorry and all that in them is who by the mouth of thy servant or David has said why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things now if um Excuse me, let, let, let me go down to verse 28. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. So this is what the church is praying to the Lord after Peter and John had come back. We should be content in God's providence. We should be content in God's will. Peter and John did not come back from jail, barely escaping their life and being fearful and nervous. They weren't. They were exhilarated. Now remember, uh, all of the epistles, how about how it says we should rejoice if we're buffeted for Christ, if we're persecuted in Christ, how they were exhilarated that they got to suffer in the name of Christ. We preached in the name of Christ. And you know, Peter, uh, you know, that's the thing is when the Holy Spirit take, takes over and, and he did exactly what Jesus said would happen, that he would fill his mouth and gave Peter the confidence and the boldness and the assurance and preached Christ in the Holy Spirit. You know, Peter, I, I imagine that... He, was, he probably couldn't sleep for three days after that, you know? I, I imagine he couldn't. I imagine that all fill, you know, filled Peter up. And then here's the church praying to the Lord. And if you want to look up the reference that they're making, it's in Psalm 2. How the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing. And uh, the, the unity that comes to these people. In 1 Peter 4.14, If you be reproached for the name of Christ... Happy are ye. <laughs> I imagine when he was pinning that, he was like, wow, I was really happy. <laughs> you know, I, uh, Happy are ye. Uh, and the last one, be desirous of confidence and boldness from God. In verse 29 through 31. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness that they may speak 
thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus and when they had prayed the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness and that boldness in the Greek means confidence it means plainly openly freedom and fearlessness in Philippians 1.20, Paul says that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, Christ shall be magnified in my body, rather by life or by death. The church of Jesus Christ was the Lord's true church. And this was God's Messiah. And this was the way of salvation. This was the new covenant. This was the New Testament. And this was the preaching and then just as Jesus would say, they were met with opposition. But as we said at the very beginning of this sermon, that it seemed like the persecution just brought the people more resolved and had the spirit more and brought the, the people more together. And so should it be with us as we come in here from the world stains and the sin and everything, that we should have that in common. That we're striving against sin all week. And that, you know, we're, we're, we're in the word. We're in prayer. We're asking the Lord to help us. And, um, you know, it, we may not ever be persecuted like they were. But, you know, the last point was be desirous that the Lord give us confidence and boldness in that day. Confidence and boldness in that day. Let us be filled with the spirit because the day may come and if that day does come happy are ye and uh, I it's just one of those things that we see throughout the word of God and we know that right now we're it seems like we're living in the exception not the norm it seems like that where the preach where the word of Christ is preached there will be those who hate you and more will not you know almost expect it that's all I have for this evening. Let's all stand. Brother Chapman, if you want to lead us in a word of invitation. I shall